New York, it's where the Mets call home. It's where their heart is. But lately, New York has not been where the winds have been. At City Field in New York, the New York Mets play the Milwaukee Brewers. Friday Night Baseball is presented by Time Warner Cable. And a pleasant good evening, everybody, and welcome to City Field. Gary Cohen, Ron Darling, Keith Hernandez with you tonight as the Mets play their final Friday night game of the season as they take on the Milwaukee Brewers. The Mets have finished their road schedule for the year. They finished 41 and 40 on the road. But home, that's been a different story. 14 games under 500, the third straight year that the Mets have had a better road record than home record. And the question is, why? It's hard to put your finger on it, but it's been uh, epidemic. It's been over more than a few years. What stands out to me more than anything, Gary, is the 219 batting average with runners in scoring position. When you're hitting like that, you're not scoring runs, and thus the run, run differential. What always comes to my mind is what do you need that can get a team over the top? And I always look to that uh, Philadelphia Philly World Championship team when Pete Rose came over to that richly talented team with Mike Schmidt, Bake McBride, Steve Carlton. They had lost in the playoffs a couple times, couldn't get the big brass ring. Rose came over, and that kind of player, that kind of personality, that alpha male, really, they wouldn't have won without Pete. Uh, is there someone out there like that? I don't know. I haven't seen it lately. You know, you saw in those stats, the Mets average a run less per game at home than they do on the road. They've pitched better at home than on the road, but not by nearly as much. So, obviously, offense is an issue. Is pitching as well? I think, I think pitching has been better at home. Uh, it hasn't been great. I think the issue for the pitching, really, for Terry Collins and Dan Worthen, is that in this ballpark, a lot of different style pitchers can be successful. The one thing that you have to do here, though, you cannot walk people. That is the key to pitching a ballpark where you can keep the ball in the ballpark. On the mound for the Mets tonight, making his final start of the year is Carlos Torres. And all in all, this has been a very good Good year for Carlos Torres. I really enjoyed watching him pitch both out of the bullpen and in his eight starts coming off a good start in the last start against Philadelphia where he got the win. The Brewers will send out their ace Giovanni Gallardo. His season started poorly but much better lately. Well Gallardo is an outstanding pitcher. Not great start against the Mets there. They shut them, him down in the middle of the summer because of a hamstring. He's come back and pitched like the old Gallardo. 80 wins in his career. Just three games to go in the season for the Mets as they take on the Brewers tonight at City Field. Hoping for some better home cooking. All the action coming your way tonight right here on SNY.
cable. Watch more sports on more devices in the house than anyone else. Call 1-800-TW-CABLE. Time Warner Cable. Enjoy sports better. Buy your local Tri Honda dealers. Hurry to your local Tri Honda dealer for great deals on the 2013 models. And buy Bob's Discount Furniture. Proud to be the furniture store of the New York Mets. Swing for the fences with the new Home Run Derby mobile game from MLB.com. Available on iPhone and iPad and select Android devices. Download free today. The Mets and the Brewers from the big town. First pitch from City Field coming right up. out how good LIU Brooklyn find out how good you really are. Hyundai starting lineup for the Brewers they get Carlos Gomez back tonight after a one game suspension after his dust up with the Braves two nights ago. Otherwise the same unit that put together a four run inning against Dylan G last night on route to a four to two win. You know it's amazing when you have a contract that has a clause and it says that if you are not brought to the big leagues you can opt out and go to another organization. The Mets decided to keep Torres. They called him up and he's been missed Mr. Versatility ever since. Great in this ballpark 2.40 ERA. And the defense behind Mr. Torres at your Lexus Metropolitan defense. Uh, of course right glancing blow more than a glancing blow off the head Turner will play third base tonight Tovar back in the lineup has done a nice job at shortstop and everybody else same cast of characters Wright's head is perfectly fine he passed all the concussion tests it's his right thumb that's keeping him out of the lineup mm. tonight he did some tests throwing and swinging oh, yeah. couldn't quite get the proper grip so he'll sit out tonight. By the way, interesting, Ronnie, that you mentioned the opt-out clause for Torres because I was thinking about this. The opt-out clause for Torres, which the Mets decided to keep him by bringing him up. The opt-out clause that Ardsma had with the uh, the Marlins, he exercised that. The Mets signed him, and the opt-out clause that Daisuke had with Cleveland, he exercised that, and the Mets signed him. So it's yep. helped them on three fronts this right. year. Mm. 
Your umpiring crew, the veteran Dell Scott is the crew chief. He has the plate taught Titchener at uh, first, DJ Rayburn at second, and CB Buckner is the umpire at third. Carlos Torres' ninth start, 23 relief outings with that, a 3.36 ERA, a terrific year for Carlos. Most innings he's ever pitched in the major leagues, 80 and a third. Nori Aoki leads off from Milwaukee and takes low and inside for ball one, and we're underway. Aoki 0 for 4 last night had been a very hot hitter coming into the series. Mm. Oh, Torres yeah. falls behind him 2 and out. Two nights in a row with the Jets taking off overhead. Scooter Jeanette on deck, and then Jonathan Lucroy for the Brewers in the first. And Aoki takes a cutter for a strike, two and one. Carlos Torres, 30 years old, had big league experience with the White Sox and the Rockies before this year. Aoki drives one deep toward the right field corner. That ball is out of here. Nori Aoki leads off the game with his eighth home run of the year, and the Brewers jump in front, one nothing. What do you always say about down and in, Keith? To lefties. Well, you know what? I want to take a the better look at it. This was no, wasn't Scooter a bad Jeanette. breaking slider. I don't know if he left it out over the middle a little too much. Did he get it in enough? It broke nice. Uh, he got it. He, he went out and got it. Inner half. Remember, the way he hits, the inside okay. corner is more like the middle of the plate. Right. He's like halfway running. Yeah. The last weekend of City Field's fifth year. The game begins the way the first game the first season began. The Jody Garrett home run on a down and in pitch. Scooter Jeanette one for four last night at a two run single. And he takes one on the outside corner of strike one and one. Well, look at the contact. He is driving right in stiff legged. That right leg. That's a lot of torque on the waist and the lower back. Torres gets one under the knees for a strike, and it's one and two to Jeanette. So Aoki's eighth home run of the year puts the Brewers out early. It's 14 home runs given up by Torres in 80 and the third inning. So that clearly has been the one troubling piece of his game as Jeanette swings and misses. Ball to the backstop and the throw too late, and Jeanette arrives safely. So Torres gets a strikeout. The ball eludes Darno, and Jeanette winds up on first base. This has got to be an error to the catcher. I don't think this ball hit the ground. I think it's got to be an E2, don't you, Gap? Or a pass ball. There's no, there's no error in that to pass ball? They're going to call it a wild pitch. Okay. Saying it was too far away for Darno to be expected to handle. It's a pass ball. <laughs> a wild pitch. Well, I, I agree with you there. In any either event, Jeanette's on first, and Jonathan Lucroy the batter. Lucroy one for three, a double and a stolen base last night. He's playing first base today, just the ninth time he started there, coming out from behind the plate. Chris Davis on deck. And the Brewers plan to do this more and more with Lucroy, who's one of their better hitters, to keep him in on days when he doesn't catch. So a difficult start for Torres. A home run, a strikeout, a wild pitch, and still nobody out. And a balk is called. A balk called on Torres. Apparently did not come to a full stop. And Jeanette goes to second base. It's got to be a discernible stop uh, when you're in the stretch before you go to the plate. Let's see if Carlos Torres did that. Boy. I tell you what, that's, not, that's a little picky, isn't it? Attention to the first base umpire called it. It's a little picky. I mean, he's behind the pitcher. You'd think the third base umpire would see that better. Because if you watch Torres, he had two breaks. He has one around his sternum and then one at the belt. So Torres filling out the stat sheet early in this game. Home run, wild pitch, balk. Is the hit batsman next? Lucroy grounds one to short. The runner will advance. Tovar throws out Lucroy for the game's first out as Jeanette goes to third. Good base running by Jeanette. So he's at third base with one away.
So now Chris Davis will try and get the run in. Davis won for three last night. It was a late insertion of the lineup when Carlos Gomez set out his one game suspension. Davis 132 at bats, 10 home runs. So he's been a very pleasant surprise for the Brewers. 25 year old rookie out of Cal State Fullerton. Infield back. And that one kicks off the shin guards of Darno. And Jeanette thought about it, but then goes back to third. Just another cutter that lands before the plate. See Darno's body. That's the one thing he's going to have to work on in the winter. He's going to have to square it up. He's a little sideways. And like whenever anything caroms off something that's turned sideways, it's going to work its way away from you, not stay in front of you. One and one to Davis. Chris Davis, 69 games in Triple A this year, had 13 home runs there. So. 23 home runs for the season combined between Triple A and the big leagues. It's a good year to be Chris Davis. With a C or even a K. The curveball hit well out to left field. Back goes Young. And it's over his head. And it's out of here. Chris Davis with a two run homer. Second home run of the opening inning for the Brewers. And Milwaukee has a three nothing lead. And the Cheeseheads are happy. Home run number 11 for Chris Davis. That's 11 home runs in just 133 at bats. Well, that is also the 15th home run given up by Carlos Torres in 80 in the third innings, 82 thirds. That's a hanging slider right there, right in the wheelhouse. And he crushed it. Been an interesting swing day. This reminds me a lot of Jason Worth a little bit, an extension. So here's Carlos Gomez who sat out last night under suspension. Gomez having a tremendous year. Seventh in the National League in slugging percentage among other things and a swinging bunt. They'll have to let it roll and it does go foul. That slider that hangs inside folks if you just keep the shoulder in. Let the ball come to you and it breaks out in full extension. Don't rush out and get it. A lot of hitters get anxious, particularly the young hitters, and go out and try to grab at it early, too early. Let it break into your bat. It's a beautiful thing. So a rugged start for Carlos Torres. Not a beautiful thing for him by any means. Two strike count on Gomez. And he got him with a high fastball for the second out. So Gomez out on three pitches, two away. Second strikeout for Torres. First one that's resulted in an out. 145th strikeout for Gomez. And just got tied up upstairs. And that's where they wanted it. So two out and nobody on for Jeff Bianchi. Moved up to number six in the order tonight. The shortstop, one for four, drove in a run last night. And he takes a fastball for a strike. Regular shortstop Gene Segura continues to be sidelined with a hamstring problem. And that has opened up the door for Eric Young to try and win the National League stolen base title. Young stole two bases last night to tie Segura for the league lead. Before the game, Segura was out running the bases today trying to see if he could go. Eric said he was looking forward to the competition. Not heartbroken that Segura had to sit out last night. Broken back grounder, Tovar charging, and throws out Bianchi to end the inning. But a three run first for the Brewers, a couple of long balls. Nori Aoki with his second career leadoff home run, his eighth of the year. And Chris Davis with a two run shot, his 11th, puts the bats an early 3 0 hole.
Two hole for the first time since 2010. Justin Turner slides into the cleanup spot as the Mets go after Giovanni Gallardo. Whom they faced earlier this season in Milwaukee. Gallardo in his first 23 starts, 8 and 9 with a 5 ERA. Rested his hamstring. Last seven, 3 and 1 with a 2.35 ERA. Eric Young takes high. Young one for four with a couple of steals last night. It's a five game hitting streak going. Young Duda and Murphy for the Mets in the opening inning down by three. And Eric takes a knee high strike one and one. Interesting move putting Duda in the two hole. Comes into the night with a 352 on base percentage struggling to get hits. Two and one to Young. Gallardo, one of the few pitchers who throws straight over the top. So he'll get a lot of calls on that low strike. He likes to live low in the strike zone. Chopper to the right side, a foul ball came off the leg of Young. Gallardo reminds me with his wind up, Ronnie, a lot like yours. It's, he did, you didn't go low like yeah. that, but. Yeah, it's pretty similar yeah. when you think about yeah. it. Uh, yes, the way he does his, that, it looks like you. That's funny. Absolutely. Gallardo's strikeout numbers are down this year. Coming into the season, he had averaged better than a strikeout per inning across his career. This year, just 7.1 strikeouts per nine innings. Young lifts one to left, and Chris Davis is right there waiting for it. One away. All right, in the Coors Light, Brew Crew defense, and Gomez, of course, we knew when he was a Met that he was outstanding with his glove, strong arm, can cover a lot of ground. He's a Gold Glover out there. There's no question about that. Well, he's had himself a fine year, no question about it. Offensively, defensively, temperament, fine year with a bad moment. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So here's Duda, who's got great numbers against Gallardo, three for seven with two home runs in their past meetings. What do you think about this Duda hitting second? Uh, I can't say that I like it. I don't like clog people clogging up bases on top of the lineup. I'm a third hitter, boy. Double's not going to get me a ribeye steak. Very selfish. <laughs> Might get you second and third for the cleanup hitter, though. <laughs> Well, the Mets just trying something of course. late in the season. Their lineup very depleted, especially with Wright sitting out tonight. And you got Turner hitting cleanup and Brown hitting fifth. And Curve Ball, he went around for strike three, so Gallardo has his first strike out of the night. And Lucas has been getting very frustrated. Gallardo has a good one. Straight over the top, 12 to 6. Keeps fighting here. And when you're ahead 0 2, that's where you want to throw the pitch. Out of the strike zone. Hope you get a swing in it. And that's what we got from Duda. For Gallardo, career strike at number 1,075. He's now six behind Teddy Higuera for second place on the all-time Brewers strikeout Ooh. list. Number one is Ben Sheets at 1,206. Daniel Murphy with two out and nobody on. Fouls off the first pitch fastball. Murphy has an eight-game hitting streak going after going one for five with a double last night. Justin Turner hitting cleanup tonight would be next. In the American League wild card race, Tampa Bay starts a series in Toronto facing R.A. Dickey tonight. Dickey began the night having given up 33 home runs this year. He's now given up 35. Ben Zobrist in the first, Dillman Young in the second, 2 0 Tampa Bay. I just remember the first start Dickey made this year. I forgot who the hitter was, but it was a right hand hitter who hit a home run to right field at Rogers Center. And the expression on Dickey's face was priceless. It was like, are you kidding me? And he hasn't stopped giving up home runs since. 35 now. Well, Dorothy wasn't in Kansas, and Dickey isn't at City Field anymore. And Cy has flown. <laughs> Another big important game up there, Cincinnati and Pitt, they're off. Bottom of the first. No score. You mentioned Teddy Higuera before, Gary. Few folks who don't remember what a great pitcher he was for the Brew Crew. 
Starting his rookie year, he went 15 and 8, 20 and 11, 18 and 10, 16 and 9, and then he hurt his arm. Unbelievable lefty. Two two to Murphy, and it's off the plate. Three and two. How about this idea? Dickey having a rough year in Toronto. Let's get him back cheap. No can pitch here. Sell high by low. <laughs> All right. You know, Darno catching Dickey. <laughs> Never know. Three two to Murphy and he slaps it foul. I like the setup by the um, catcher for the Milwaukee Brewers. He he's in a ready position. You know you have infielders that are in a ready position. He gets down. He gets down low. And with that position, it looks like he can react to any pitch, whether it's in the dirt or left or right. Martin Maldonado's had a tough year with the bat, but they love his defense. Right back to Gallardo. And Murphy retired to end the inning. Gallardo has a 1 2 3 first, 3 0 Milwaukee after one. Runs at home in a single season. Just for reference, the Mets club record for home runs in a season is 41. So, who had the most at home in one year? At which home? Hmm. Unieski Betancourt leads off in the second inning. Betancourt playing third base again tonight. Went one for four last night. Ramos Ramirez tweaked his knee in the scuffle with the Braves two nights ago and may not. Play this weekend. So Bedcourt getting the start at third. Torres working quickly and he strikes out Bedcourt for his third strikeout of the night. One out of the second. Well, this is a good slider by Torres. That's what he's kind of done. Gotten ahead with a cutter and made that cutter a little bigger into a slider when he gets ahead. So here's Martin Maldonado, the catcher. He's had 180 at bats this year and hitting just 167. 47th game he started this year. He takes the cutter off the plate for ball one. You got Maldonado in the eighth spot, Giovanni Gallardo in the ninth spot. Who's the better hitter? Gallardo. Maldonado, you hope, develops into a hitter. I'm only saying that because. Cardo has 12 home runs in his career, uh, over a 200 hitter in his career. He is very dangerous. Fly ball hit out to right center. And Andrew Brown takes charge of it. Two out. 
With Carlos Zambrano now seemingly out of the game, I would say Gallardo is probably the best home run hitting pitcher around. Yeah. He's just uh, he's a, a, a talented, athletic uh, pitcher, and he's had some great years for the Brewers. I mentioned he has 80 career wins for the Brew Crew. I mean, think about this for an offensive standpoint. Guerrero has 360 career at bats. He's got 19 doubles, 12 home runs. Position player would be pretty proud of those extra base sure. hit numbers. I feel diminished in this chair. I feel like Ronnie's like towering over me. Ronnie well, usually switch. has well, the. Let's, uh, let's switch. Ronnie let's usually has like, the lower chair. I have the lower well, chair. Well, let's switch here. You give me that I, one. I feel like I take this one. I want my Mapo. <laughs> <laughs> strike three call. Diarno out on strikes. There we go. Musical chairs in the booth. Couple of strikeouts in the inning for Torres. <laughs> they go to the bottom of the second. Three nothing Milwaukee. Iced tea that tastes like real iced tea since 1960. National League stolen base leader has had fewer than 50 steals in consecutive seasons only once. Well, the National League leader should have under 50 steals this year with Young and Segura tied at 44 for the lead right now. Justin Turner leads off the home second. Turner came off the bench when David Wright was hurt last night, went two for three. He's been hitting. The ball better late in the season than he has all year. And that's with a two week break because of a hamstring problem. David sitting out tonight. He took some swings in the cage, tried to do some throwing, pronounced the thumb not quite ready, and we'll see whether he's able to play either in the next two days. The good thing is that the, uh, the ball hitting him in the helmet appeared to have produced. No damage. Passed all the concussion tests, no headache. As far as that's concerned, he's perfectly fine. He certainly had a frame of reference when he got hit last night, having been plunked far more severely four years ago. And David, when he went down, said he realized immediately that it was not that bad. But that by the time he stood up, the decision had been made for him to yeah. come out of the game. Well, this ball follows him in. By the way, I found out today that that pitch was a changeup. Yeah, we didn't know that at the time. 
I don't think that's any comfort though. No, 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 no <laughs> not at all. I know I'm just saying my own knowledge, not. And Turner lines another base hit. And Justin Turner continues to swing the bat well. And the Mets have their first base runner of the night. Fastball away, right down the inner half. Turner jumps all over it upstairs. Turner's a high ball hitter all the way. Gets his average over 280 for the year. So runner at first and nobody out here's Andrew Brown who has really struggled lately. He's gotten a lot of playing time coming down the stretch, but he's just four for his last 43. Hitting a 224 for the year. And he bloops one behind the second baseman and it falls in for a hit. Turner will go first to third. And the Mets have runners at the corners and nobody out. So Andrew Brown, after struggling, finds that a bloop can make you happy. Well, it kind of muscles, oh, it's a hanging slider again. So, but he muscles it out over the infield. Turner gets a beautiful read. Never hesitates, first to third. So the Mets with a chance to get right back after falling behind 3-0. Here's the new Papa, Juan Lagares, whose son Juan Jr. was born yesterday. So congratulations to Juan and his girlfriend. Lagares just one for 12 in the series in Cincinnati. Hitting at 249 on the year. And he takes it off the corner from Gallardo, ball one. Travis Darno, who has really swung the bat well the last week, waiting on deck. 27 year old Giovanni Gallardo, born in Mexico, grew up in Fort Worth, Texas. And Lagares hits one out to center field. Medium depth for Gomez, tagging at third Turner. He's going to head home. Gomez's throw is cut off. Turner scores to cut the Brewers' lead to three to one. Sacrifice fly for Lagares, his 34th run batted in. Ball down in the strike zone. Another slider he left over the inner part of the plate. He's not, uh, he's getting on top too much, looks like, huh, Ronnie? You, know, you talked to a lot of the people with the Milwaukee Brewers, they said that Gallardo, pitching the World Baseball Classic from Mexico, throwing 94 miles an hour in Arizona in March, and he never recovered until this rest that he just recently had before these last seven starts. His last on Saturday lost a tough game to the Cardinals gave up just two runs and four hits in seven innings. Here's Darno two for three last night. He takes a curveball in the dirt. Darno up to 200 for the year so he's up to the Mendoza line. This is how you do it guys. Nice. I'm getting better than that. Molina like. They had him with those legs widespread with nobody on. A little different with a runner at first base. Nope, you just want to cup your body, get your glove down, and you smother. Use two hands too. Nicely done. Nope. Used to call Gary Carter Bjorn Borg. So Ivan Lendl on the baseline could get anything by him. <laughs> Don't have any picture Gary with a tennis racket. Bjorn Borg was like ice. At that resting heartbeat of 35. Yeah. He there was a great interview with Bjorn Borg and he you know he projected this calm on the court but he said it was very revealing. My brother called me and my brother and I love tennis. 
and had the good fortune of being able to go into the U.S. Open back in those days when there was just terrific competition in Borg was the, in his prime. And Borg in the interview said, you know, when he had to serve in a, in a, in a, a fifth set, you know, where he's got a hold serve and he's one point away, that he was nervous throwing that ball up, had to take a deep breath. He's just human, too. I, that was a great interview, very revealing, because you just think you look at these guys on TV and just think, well, they're all pros, but they have their moments, too. Well, he masked it well. Darno chases a pitch in the dirt. And Gallardo has his second strikeout, two out of the inning. Well, the thing about Gallardo is that not many Mets have seen a curveball like this. It's just a straight downer in the day. They would have called it a drop. It's got incredible spin on it. So two on now Wilfredo Tovar is making his fourth major league start. Three hits and ten at bats so far with a couple of RBIs. After going home to Venezuela and getting all ready for winter ball. Called back after a season in double A and taking advantage of his early earlier than expected major league opportunity. Pitcher Torres would be next. Bonnie Gallardo last year 16 and 9, 3.66. A little tougher slog for him this year. Tovar fouls it away, one and two. Now the one two and Tovar dribbles one that'll go foul. Is it just me or is the knob on Tovar's bat a little bit oversized almost forcing him to choke up. Mm. Well, if it's it's not forcing him to choke up, it's what he desires. That's his preference. <clears throat> and he is choking up. I never cared for a knob like that, to be honest with you. <laughs> Curveball strikes him out. Gallardo with back-to-back -back strikeouts to end the inning. Mets get one run and trail with three to one as we head to the third inning at City Field.
award winners the Sterling Awards and all those young men are in town. Kevin Burkhardt's out of town and so Gary Apple is filling that role and we're so pleased to have Gary with us. Gary is standing by with one of the Mets honorees tonight. Gary. All right. Thank you so much Gary. Good to be with you guys as well. Noah Syndergaard is standing alongside certainly one of the names that Met fans are very much aware of and spent part of this year at single A part of the year at double A. You were here for the futures game and said it was the first time you were here in New York City. You enjoyed the Big Apple. You want to get back here. Oh, it was awesome. It's an unbelievable experience. I mean, the city, I mean, you really can't compare it to another one. I mean, I'm from Dallas and still that city just can't compare to New York City. It was an awesome time. The fans are so welcoming and I'm, I'm, I'm actually glad to be back here. So as I mentioned, part of the year you spent single A and then double A where you were six and one at Binghamton. What was the biggest difference that you found from that single A to double A jump? I feel like the hitters kind of go up there with a little bit more approach. I mean, I'm, right now I'm mainly fastball orientated. So we're, so that's why I think my stats were better in double A than they were in high A because the hitters in, uh, in high A, I feel like they were just ambushing fastballs. So the, the hitters in double A go up to the better, a little better approach, uh, look for certain pitches. And um, you know, I'm, I'm, I was really happy with my, the way my season went. There's a single into right field. Uh, so during this offseason, and, and again, we don't know where you're going to figure in next year. I know Met fans are excited that the sooner you can get here. But what do you work on dur during the offseason? Uh, right now, I feel like one of my biggest weaknesses is uh, my changeup. Right now, I mean, like, uh, in Double A, I was just working fastball, curveball, and I can get get, a, get away with some of those pitches. But I didn't really have to throw my changeup all that much. But uh, there's one thing that uh, Glenn Abbott really taught me is you uh, you, you don't want to pitch in Double A. You don't have success in Double A or Triple A. You want to you want to pitch in the big leagues. That's the ultimate goal in mind. So. In order to do so, I got to be able to develop my changeup. And, and did I hear you say you're going to work with, with Dylan G during the offseason? He's a Texas guy as well. I, I would like to. We we swap numbers in the clubhouse, and uh, hopefully we'll spend some time together, just a little bit of hunting, and uh, you know, hopefully he can uh, give me a few pointers on the changeups. I know he's got a good one. What about goals as you get uh, set next year to go to spring training? Do you want to make it difficult for the Mets not to bring you north? Um. Yes, uh, I would like. Uh, basically, I mean, this off season, I'm just gonna get, get in the weight room and uh, get as strong as possible, and then come into spring training as as uh, as prepared as I've ever been. So, uh, hopefully, uh, next year I'll be able to get a call up some point. Have you had a chance to visit with with Zach Wheeler and with with Matt Harvey? Uh, Zach, a little bit. I still haven't met uh, Matt yet, but uh, I both I, I admire their uh, their savvy on the mound. Um, they both go out there. And uh, there's a bulldog out there. They give their uh, their team an opportunity to win. Uh, what about growing up? Was there a and again down in Texas? Was there a, a hero, a favorite player, a pitcher that you uh, were quite fond of? Uh, I liked growing up uh, watching Nolan Ryan mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, Josh Beckett and Verlander as well. And did, did, have you patterned yourself? After, did you find things from those guys that you could put into your repertoire? I can see little things here and there that uh, that are similar between those pitchers. So I just power pitcher the, the good strong fastball and pretty good secondary pitches. So when you get on the mound and I'll, I'll leave you on this one when you get on the mound and, and we see this with Matt Harvey he, he feels like he can dominate a game but yet he learns to pitch. It, there's a, a, a process in learning how to pitch. Do you feel like a dominant pitcher that you can strike everybody out or, or is that process in full effect of learning how to be a big league pitcher. I'm sorry what was that again. Uh, learning how to be a, not just a flamethrower but being a pitcher and learning not just to strike everybody out but to to, to manage a game and, and use your control. Well that's one thing I learned real, real quick when I got into pro ball is man hitters can hit a fastball. I mean I, when I was playing high school I just throw fastballs right down the middle and uh, well actually I actually learned pretty quickly in high school as well because there's one playoff game where I was first two, first two pitches of the game were off the wall so I had to revert to a curveball as I hadn't thrown pretty much all year. But uh, same thing translating to the big leagues and uh, playing professional baseball you got to be able to locate you got to be able to locate both sides of the plate and uh, make some secondary pitches over. Well, it's great to see you Noah. we look forward to seeing you here in Flushing in the very near future. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Great to be with you. We said it back to you guys Gary Keith Ronnie. Hi Gary uh, Noah Syndergaard a very large man six foot six two hundred forty Gary Apple is not small just <laughs> just just so you know. <laughs> a very well spoken yeah. young man. Well, of course Syndergaard came over in the trade with Travis Darno from the Blue Jays and the R.A. Dickey deal and 
it, it's amazing how his stature has grown within the organization as this year has gone along. Well, uh, if you talk to some people before, uh, after the trade, you had some folks, you know, the projecting. They love to project these pitchers as a one, two, three, four, five, and and there were some projecting who's going to be a middle of the type rotation guy. But after his great season this year, um, they're looking for more. Were those the same people who were projecting that Matt Harvey was going to be a number three starter? I don't know that. I don't <laughs> like to cast aspersions, Gary. But just but part of that, and, and it's it's interesting, isn't it? When you look back on on what people think and what people say as um, as players move up through the minor leagues, the fact of the matter is that you never really know for sure till the guy gets here what he's going to be. No, well, that's the truth. Uh, because once you get here, and uh, it sounded like Noah enjoys. Uh, the city here and city field. Uh, once you get here, it's a little bit of a culture shock, and some handle it better than others. One out and one on a two strike count to Jonathan Lucroy. Well, certainly the expectation for Syndergaard is that he would start next year either in double A or up in triple A. Not likely at all that he starts the year in the major leagues next year. In fact, it was interesting listening to Terry Collins talk tonight. He didn't believe that Rafael Montero or Jacob DeGrom had a chance to make the team out of spring training next year. Which I think works counter to what some people's expectations are. Hmm. Well, I think it might be a little psychological too. No one's got a job, and mm -hmm. hey, yeah, nothing's handed to you. Torres ahead one and two and Luke Roy fouls off the cutter. Well I'm glad that Noah got to work with Glenn Abbott. Uh, he was with the Texas Rangers when I first came to spring training and uh, he was one of those veteran pitchers that I wouldn't say took you under your wing because guys really didn't take him under your wing in those days. But uh, he's awfully nice to me and I'll never forget it. By the way uh, big pitchers from Texas admiring. Nolan Ryan and Josh Beckett's right. That's not a new thing, is it? No. <laughs> Eighth pitch of the at bat, and Luke Roy just got a piece of that one, and that one struck Darno. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if he's motioning for the pitches to be away or for Worth and telling Darno maybe to back up a little bit. Maybe he's a little too close to the hitter. Lucroy's fouled off five in a row. And Torres nearly threw that away. Ioki at first has 20 steals this year. Brewers lead the National League in stolen bases. And that one just missed outside, two and two. Lucroy 18 home runs 82 runs batted in he's had a terrific year. Lucroy's an interesting hitter because he hits the all fields. We watched him yesterday almost hit ball out of right field. Quick inside. 2 2. Mm -hmm. off another one. 10, 10 pitches deep in this at bat and still going. Lucroy reminds me a little of now not his game because he was very quick but the quick swing from Jason Kendall you know, short quick to the ball good athlete Corey probably a little more power than Kendall. Well it's going on and on. You hmm. stayed away from him Ronnie hasn't come in. Well I, I think that's the thing where, where Torres is going to not give up as much home runs as he has is when he establishes inside to the right handed hitters because if he makes any kind of mistake uh, they have not been brushed back off the plate made their you gotta make their feet move a little bit you get too comfortable in there in the box when every pitch is middle away this will be the 12th pitch of the at bat from Torres to Lucroy slow ground ball Turner goes to second with it and gets the force there. 
Well, handcuffed Justin a little bit, but he ball. stayed with it for the second out. Ball came up, and that's why you always get in front of a ball when you can. Ball came up, used two hands. Nicely done. He almost tripped there, but nice recovery. So Luke Croy, a slower runner, replaces Ioki at first with two out. Now Chris Davis. Who hit one into the Party City deck for a two run homer his first time up. Brewers hit two home runs off Torres in the first inning. Ioki a leadoff shot, and then Davis a two run homer. Crack research staff has told us that the Mets have given up leadoff home runs in the first inning five times this year, and that Torres has allowed three of the five. He gave one up to Andrelton Simmons against the Braves and to Denard Span against the Nationals. Line oh. off Torres' foot, he recovers <laughs> and makes the play. That's a catch. They say that he caught it in the air. Didn't even have to throw to first. Yeah, it hit the foot, came right up to him, and once he caught it, it was an out. Hacky sack at its best. This will go against his ground ball percentage. That's an out in the air. Is that the third straight Mets pitcher to get hit in the yeah. foot? That was remarkable. to the minute news and opinion plus fan discussions player profiles and exclusive video on Jets blog featured on SNY.TV your online home of all things New York sports. Carlos Torres one for 14 at the plate leads off in the home third Mets down three to one. Eric Young on deck and then Lucas Duda against Giovanni Gallardo. He bids for his 12th win of the year in his final start. Curve ball just off the plate, one and two. If you want to stay with us the next half inning? That's General Manager Sandy Alderson will be joining us. Certainly, plenty of pertinent topics to discuss as the Mets head into the offseason. It's going to be a very busy offseason for Sandy and his group. I guess that's pretty trite. 
but you're talking about a team that has a lot of questions to answer. Many of them about their own personnel yeah. before you even think about what they want to bring in from the outside. And Torres out on strikes. Three consecutive strikeouts for Giovanni Gallardo. Sometimes that's the case, isn't it? Uh, kind of scouting your own players, projecting your own guys. Where are they going to be? Have they gotten better? Have they stayed the same? Have they gotten worse? Are they going to get better? Um, those are all tough questions from a lot of the Mets players. There are also existential questions this franchise needs to ask. We raised one of the opener. Why is this team so much more successful away from City Field? Another question is, what's the payroll going to be? What are the parameters that Sandy's going to be operating under this winter? And you know, all those questions have to be answered before you can start formulating a game plan of how you move forward. Eric Young takes a strike. Eric flying out to left his first time up. Talking about home and road numbers, Eric Young certainly prominent there. He's done far better on the road than at home. Juan Magaris, Daniel Murphy, Lucas Duda. Listen, huge. Wow. Huge difference. See, now we talk all the time about City Field being a good pitcher's ballpark because it's got large dimensions, but that shouldn't affect the the guys who aren't power hitters should it? Well, it which, should help them. Right, Eric Young's not a home run hitter. He's at two all year. So why would he have such a great disparity home and road? It just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And again, if it were a one-year phenomenon, you could chalk it up as happenstance. You know, it seems hot when they're on the road. They're not as hot when they're at home. But again, three straight years. Now it's only the seventh time in Major League history that the team's gone three straight years with a better road record than home record. Slowly hit down to first, and Luke Roy makes the flip to the pitcher for the second out. Toronto is tied up Tampa Bay two to two. That game's in the fourth inning. Tampa Bay a game ahead of Cleveland, two games up on Texas. Three teams playing for two spots in the American League Wild Card race. Texas about to start at home against the Angels, facing the former Rangers C.J. Wilson tonight. Who's won 17 ball games this year? And Cleveland will be at Minnesota. With Corey Kluber on the mound for the Indians. Nobody, they Ferrer runners on first and second in Pittsburgh. I see one out. Pitts threatening. I like the fact that they have that up there. They want the scoreboard where you know what the men on base. The two green lights. Pirates batting against Homer Bailey. AJ Burnett pitching for Pittsburgh. Because that series is. Probably just for home field advantage in the wild card game. And that means a lot. So Pittsburgh with a win with a one game lead can really be in the driver's seat. Well, whoever wins two out of three in that series right. gets the home game. Yeah. The only other possibility is if the Pirates win all three and the Cardinals lose all three, they would tie for the division title. But that's not really a likely scenario. Don't change my flight. <laughs> St. Louis playing at home against the Cubs. This weekend, they'll have Lance Lynn on the mound tonight against Travis Wood. That game's about 10 minutes away. Duda struck out his first time up. Danny Murphy would be next. You know, uh, I hope this doesn't sound anti Cincinnati, but I'd like the good people of Pittsburgh to get themselves a playoff game, right? Yes. Well, whether they have the home game Tuesday or not, yeah. if they win, They'll get playoff games. <laughs> Over the bag, that's a fair ball. Hits off the jutting stands. The second baseman, Jeanette, goes out to play it. Duda racing for second and gets there ahead of the tag with a double. 16th double of the year for Lucas Duda. Lucas Duda hurt himself, I think, uh, sliding to that base. Nope. You got a catcher at first base. Not a lot of range. Ball hit hard. Nice hit by Duda. A hanging breaking ball again from Gallardo over the middle. 
good hustle by Jeanette to get to that baseball. They do a long way to track that ball down. Good up here to jam that left foot against the base yeah. a little awkwardly. So he's in scoring position with two out. Appears to be just fine. Daniel Murphy, the batter, to come back to Gallardo his first time up. You got the shortstop Bianchi jockeying in behind Duda. Let's look at that slide. See how he rolls that left ankle over. Why would Bianchi be paying the first ounce of attention to Agreed. Lucas Duda at second base? I agree 100%. It's. I don't know what to tell you here. I mean, it's two out. It's not going to be running anyway. I mean, trying to cut down his secondary lid a little bit so he doesn't score on a base hit. And they put all that time in uh, hours before a game prepping the scouting reports. Opens up that hole for Murphy. He likes to take it that way. Take it himself, and that retires the side. When we come back for the fourth inning, Sandy Alderson will join us in the booth after three, three to one, Milwaukee. Most home runs at home in a single season. Ah, not anybody on this team. <laughs> that was Daryl's last year as a Met in 1990. Left as a free agent for the Dodgers after that year. Speaking of free agency and such things, Sandy Alderson, the Mets general manager, joins us. Thanks for being here. Happy to be with you. You know, it's such a long season. Um, you convene for spring training in February. There are certain expectations, both positive and negative. You you play through 160 games at this point. What is your overall view of how this team has performed versus your expectations when the year began? Well, there are obviously some disappointments, um, and uh, and yet there are some positives. Um, overall, uh, I always go into a season expecting to win. And uh, you know whether that's entirely realistic from year to year or not. Uh, that's the way I go into the season. So in that sense, as we draw to a close here, um, generally disappointed. Uh, 
you know, the one loss record, of course, uh, below 500, 12, 13 games, whatever it is, uh, particularly at home where we haven't uh, played very well. Um, <clears throat> we've had some player performances that I would say below par, below expectation, uh, choppy, uh, certainly. And we've had some injuries, uh, which always occur, but uh, and have to be anticipated, but are never really you can never really prepare for in, in a in a uh, specific way. Uh, but there have been some positives too. Um, you know, we played well on the road. I think we're one of the few teams that has a winning record on the road in the National League, at least. And um, since mid June. Uh, I think we're actually over 500 our overall record if you go back to uh, what everyone calls and I'd love to remember is uh, Super Tuesday Harvey Wheeler did. yeah <laughs> um, that was a highlight but uh, since that time I think we're over 500 which uh, you know is also a positive um, we've seen some some players emerge from our system Like Garris being an example. Um, and we've seen some some guys step up too. Um, somebody like Bobby Parnell. You know, it's uh, we're on our third closer uh, at this point of the season. And um, <clears throat> Bobby did a nice job stepping up and certainly uh, uh, Latroy has has done the same. Um, but there have been, you know, the outfield, which was much maligned. Uh, uh, by me, not the uh, <laughs> least of whom, uh, has done a nice job since that mid-June time frame with uh, Eric Young's addition and Lagaris emergence, and of course Marlon Burr has been was great all season for us in a in both an offensive and defensive role. So uh, you know there there have been positives. A big thing, of course, with uh, the Sterling Awards tonight is the, the performance of our minor league system has been outstanding this year, both uh, you know, team-wise and, and individually. So there are a lot of good things to uh, take from this. And I'm happy that we've finished relatively strong. We didn't play particularly well last night, and we're losing tonight. But uh, the games in Cincinnati, uh, sweeping Philadelphia, um, were also uh, uh, you know somewhat reassuring. So. Um, not happy, but uh, we got something to build on. And you know, I've always felt that from when I arrived here through about this point, with the expiration of some contracts, that you know, we needed to do, we needed to acquire and develop talent. We had to, unfortunately, manage our payroll and uh, at the same time try to win some games. And probably in that order of priority, I think going into next season, that uh, order changes. And um, I'm really happy that uh, you know Mets fans have been relatively patient with us uh, on that basis. Torres with a one, two, three inning. Much more coming up with Sandy Alderson. There are some of those Sterling winners. 2013, the future out of the field before the game tonight.
Dan Worthen debriefing Travis Darno after that last half inning. And that uh, will bring us to our next topic with Sandy Alderson. Some of the, the young players that have been able to bring up, certainly Travis was a guy you expected to be here a lot earlier in the season, but for the broken foot. Right. So now he's been here uh, five, six weeks. What are your impressions? Do you feel as though you have your number one catcher for the future? Uh, where does he need to go from here in order to be that guy? Well, coming into this season, you know, the issue was whether or not he was polished enough as a, as a receiver in order to uh, hold down a, a, a starting role behind the plate. And of course, as we've experienced him, I think my observation and, and most other observations, he's done a fine job behind the plate. Um, he struggled a little bit offensively, but um, Keith can probably speak to this. You know, when somebody comes up and doesn't get a hit, doesn't get a hit, doesn't get a hit, start to press, start to lose their approach, start to uh, just look for the, the results rather than focusing on, you know, sort of the process. And um, I think that's probably what happened with Travis. But if you look over the last 10 games or so, he's, you know, he's right at 300. Um, and uh, looks much more controlled at the plate. So uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that he just hasn't played that much over the last couple of years. Just hasn't had that many at bats. And certainly hasn't had that many at bats against uh, this level of competition. You know, Sandy, you mentioned the home and away. And I'm sure you've talked about it before. We certainly don't have any answers here. Uh, will you address it at, after the season and try to figure it out? Yes. I mean, we. You know, this isn't the first year this has happened. This is three years in a row. So um, I think you have to look at everything from the way the team is constructed to uh, the type of player that can play here uh, as opposed to playing elsewhere. I think you have to look at, you know, pregame activity and a variety of things. And uh, we're going to be looking for input from all kinds of sources, including the players themselves so it's it's something that absolutely has to be corrected um, you know we thought that changing the outfield fence uh, last year would have a big impact and um, it hasn't had as great an impact as uh, we would hope do you feel I mean without Harvey you got to kind of bank on maybe not having Harvey next year you never know yeah uh, that's kind of up in the air it's a big question mark uh, do you still feel you have enough pitching and when you go into the offseason what exactly are you looking for to improve the ball club? Well, if you were to go into my office now and my whiteboard, um, I like to put players above the line or below the line. Guys that, okay, above the line, those are those are guys we're counting on, and um, and don't have much reservation about. And with respect to our starting pitching, I've got three guys above the line. Now that doesn't mean that um, there aren't others in our system with uh, who will add to that depth. But when, you know, Jonathan Meese, uh, Dylan G, um, both of uh, uh, you know pitched well and are two of those three. So um, we've got a lot of depth. I think we could go into next season with what we have, but realistically, uh, you know, we may want to add someone. Um, but I wouldn't see, say that we would be adding someone at the top of the rotation. So we'll move on to uh, the position player aspect of what the Mets do, need to do in the offseason with Sandy when we come back. 3 1 Brewers as we go to the fifth.
Mets general manager Sandy Alderson and you said before the break that you've got three starting pitchers above the line. Yep. After David Wright how many position players do you have above. The well line? I've got I've got a few above the line <laughs> uh, besides David. Um, but it's it's an interesting um, uh, you know process to go through and, and try to be honest with yourself and um, you know you're not going to improve at every position uh, in one year and you really have to make a judgment about where you're weakest not just where you're strongest and uh, uh, you know as you go into the offseason um, <clears throat> this is not like a Sudoku puzzle. There's not one solution. You know, there's lots of ways that uh, things could um, bear out, and it really depends on the market for players and putting together the right package rather than trying to say, look, uh, you know, in a rigid sort of way, we, we have to have this, we have to have this, we have to have this. Um, there are obvious places where we need to improve, um, but we, you know, we're going to have to have a certain amount of flexibility as well. Is there one particular position that's going to be the hardest the most difficult call for you in terms of either evaluating what you have here or evaluating what you need to go and get to improve that spot. Well there are a couple of positions where you know there's an interesting uh, decision that will have to be made. Um, first base is one of those places certainly. Um, uh, Catcher is a is is a position that not that we would go out and find somebody to start every day, but you, know, you always have to be concerned with the possibility that someone like Travis, uh, who has a history of injury, is injured. Um, so there, you know, would there be a gap there between him and whoever else we might uh, put there if we had to on an everyday basis? Um, uh, shortstop will be another position we'll have to take a look at. Um, so you know we'll have we'll have plenty to think about. Other than wins and losses, when you sit here next year at this time, what's the one thing you'd like to see improvement in in this organization from that from now until 365 days from now? Well, I'd like to see our performance at home improve substantially. If it does, and we have a, any sort of reasonable record on the road. Um, We'll be we'll be in plus territory, but I think we've got to figure out a way to win substantially more games at home. You know, have we now? Another thing, just to put it in some perspective, um, I think coming into this series, we were four games under 500 at home since Super Tuesday. So theoretically, you know, we could have played 500 at home. For that period of time, had we had we done well in this series, the only reason for pointing it out is that when we made the moves in mid-June, where Wheeler came up and uh, we got Eric Young, uh, and we played well immediately on the road, there was a question: Well, would this translate at home? And to some extent, I think it has. Not perfectly, but um, but we certainly have played better over the last um, you know two and a half, three months of the season at home than we had before. So that's a that's that's a positive. We've, we've seen in this last month uh, uh, Andrew Brown getting a lot of play. Mike Baxter has gotten some play. Um, is that important for you to evaluate your bench for next season? Well one of the reasons that uh, some of these players have gotten play is because Terry has had to mix and match in the absence of <laughs> other players. <laughs> Well, Sandy, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us, and uh, good luck this offseason. Happy to be here, and I've uh, enjoyed your telecasts, enjoyed uh, uh, being with you on the road, and uh, look forward to it again good next luck. spring. Good All luck right. this winter. Good luck. Okay, Thanks. take care. Sandy Alderson okay. joining us in the booth. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks a lot. Halfway through, 3-1 to one Milwaukee.
We go to the bottom of the fifth inning. Travis Darno leads off for New York. Mets down three to one. Darno struck out against Giovanni Gallardo his first time up. Well, as Carlos Torres walked off the mound after that last half inning, a one-two-three inning for him, he did that. Chuck the ball up into the upper deck. And he had a one-two-three inning. In fact, he's retired nine in a row. That was rather odd. Well, um, spent a lot of time on the mound. Never once thought coming off the field of throwing the ball in the upper tank. Not once. Don't get it. Nope. It's hard to tell what that was all about. Whether that was I have the slightest idea. He has a friend sitting in the upper deck who wanted to go to baseball to. A player. They don't have <laughs> seats in the upper deck. I know. They're right behind the plate. <laughs> Now Gallardo behind on Darno three and one. He likes to play a little long toss in between innings. Maybe they put his passes up there and he's a little upset about it where his passes are sitting. Uh oh. <laughs> Maybe he didn't like the fact that he was pitching so well and we were ignoring him while we were talking to Sandy. <laughs> Always fun talking with Sandy and uh, it's interesting that as an organization they appear to be as perplexed. By the whole home road yeah. split as everybody else is. Mm. And I found it interesting that he said something that you know, you've mentioned from time to time, Keith, about pregame responsibilities and things like that. How sometimes there's more weighing on a player when he's home than just playing the, the game. Three two to Darno, and he drives one in the right center for a base hit. That's what we've been seeing, been seeing from Darno, and that's what we saw in spring training that impressed me so much was that he's got a quick bat, level swing, and gap to gap hitter. He kind of got away from that. And that's an inside, inner half fastball, a ball he could pull, and I like the idea that he went. Elected to go over the second baseman's head. When I go the other way, I say go the other way. I don't want you going the other way over the first baseman or a left hand hitter going over the third baseman. You want to drive it over the shortstop, over the uh, second baseman, into the gaps. That's where doubles come from. Here's Wilfredo Tovar struck out his first time up. Tovar grounds one to third, could be two. Betancourt to Jeanette and on to first for the 5 4 3 double play. Pitcher's best friend, got a veteran pitcher out there, knows how to induce a ground ball. Taylor made. Nice hop for Betancourt, easy turn for Jeanette. And this should always be automatic. So two out and nobody on for Torres who struck out his first time up and trying to punt his way on. But Gallardo there to make the play and that retires the side. We've played five now at City Field. Milwaukee three the Mets one.
place before the 1:10 p.m. game. All fans in attendance will receive a commemorative Mike Piazza T-shirt, courtesy of City. Visit Mets.com for tickets. Recently, Gary Apple sat down and talked with Mike Piazza about a variety of subjects, and Mike was very forthcoming about the fact that he wasn't always the best teammate. I think we want our athletes to be sometimes what we want them to be, not the way they are. And for me, um, I think I was so hyper focused on wanting to, to to carry the team and do my job and execute that I sometimes alienated, you know, some of my teammates because I was just very selfish at times. Mm -hmm. And I can freely admit that. And I, and I think, you know, you could look at it. Maybe if I was a nicer guy, but I wasn't as good a player, you know, would that would have been good? Probably not. Not not in New York. So I had to do what I had to do to to at least feel like to you know to get my job done, even though. Um, you know, you want to call it abrasive or just not engaging. It was just one of those things. You know, we, we all have to do sometimes things to 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 execute. I find that a fascinating yes. uh, piece of conversation about a what it means to be a good teammate and b what it means to be a superstar in New York and the responsibility inherent in that. And Scooter Jeanette rolls one and Murphy makes a nice play to throw him out. Well. Mike's always been very honest and forthright and um, you know I had some experiences with Mike and you always felt like you know what side of the bed did he get up on this morning and you know there's a lot of things that go with certain players that a lot's required from and Mike was asked to to carry the ball club was expected to carry the ball club and uh, he was moody I mean not everybody's moody no one's perfect and you come to the ballpark every day you're going to have your good days and your bad days. So I found that really um, I think it's great what he said. I mean he's a very honest guy and I, I appreciate what he said. Well I appreciate what he said because um, a lot nicer person now than I ever was as a player extremely moody extremely aloof at times. But that's what it took for me to try to be successful. That's the only way I could do it was to have that little bit of anger every single day. Luke Roy with the bouncer. Tovar makes the play. Two out. Well, Gary Apple conducted that interview. Let's check in with Gary, whose report will help you enjoy tonight's game better. Brought to you by Tom Warner Cable. Gary. All right, guys. It was a, a really interesting about 35, 40 minutes that I spent with with Mike Piazza. One of the other things he talked about was the fact that when he, when he signed that big contract, seven years, 91 million bucks, he went to the press conference and then went back to his room and he could not sleep. He said he he woke up in a panic. He was sweating because he realized. He had an enormous amount to live up to and he said the one thing he didn't want to happen was to get run out of town on a rail. He wanted to be a success here in the greatest city in the world and he said that drove him. It helped him become a better player and I've always been interested in Ronnie and Keith. I'm going to toss this back out at you. You both had great success in this town. Not everybody does. What is is there a common thread that, that separates guys who can perform here. Than guys who don't perform here. Well, here, I don't think there's a common thread. Everybody's different. Every personality is different. And I can certainly appreciate what Mike said. I and when I signed my big extension, my five-year extension, uh, I didn't have. I mean, the Mets were terrible, and no one thought that I was going to make a difference um, with, with the Mets uh, turning it around. Uh, certainly, I was a big, a, a big uh, component that was brought here. But no one considered me a player of Piazza's stature that could carry a ball club. Now I didn't have deep sweats, but I tell you what, when the season started on the road, I had said it before, I got nervous opening day in Cincinnati and that road trip. I had a bad series. I was nervous. I didn't want to fail. And I, like Mike, I, it wasn't a matter of me wanting to perform in the Big Apple. It didn't make a difference to me. It could have been Milwaukee. I wanted to be perform and live up to my contract, which was a lot of money back then. Uh, no matter where I was playing now the fact that it was New York. I don't know if I really appreciated that because there was no one in the ballpark when I was came to the Mets. Well I think for me and, and Keith I think you say it right. It, 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 it's little things and they're different things that make you tick. I think growing up in Massachusetts and Central Mass a tough town um, helped me when I got to this town because I knew East Coast people. I knew how they reacted. I know how they rooted for their teams, how fervent they were. 
and uh, that helped me understand the highs when I would pitch well and the lows when they were a little disappointed in your performance. And you know from Mike's perspective you can understand his trepidation because people don't remember this but when Mike came here in 1998 he struggled a lot that season and was booed quite a bit at yep. Shea Stadium during that 1998 season and there was speculation that because of that he would choose to sign elsewhere. He chose to stay in New York signed a seven year contract and you know he understood that um, if you perform you get celebrated in this town like no other but if you don't as uh, Gary quoted him you can get ridden out of town on a rail. I remember that year and he was he was getting jammed so badly and Michael remember this and I remember I went to Bobby Valentine and I said because he why doesn't he look in once in a while and Bobby just looked at me and said Keith he'll be fine. And that's that's that was Bobby's mantra. Mike's going to be fine. He's a great hitter, and he was right. Little looper into shallow. Ryan Davis has a two-out hit. And for the next four years, from from '99 till 2002, he was just tremendous. I mean, in <laughs> every regard, uh, carried the Mets to the postseason a couple of years in a row. Had just tremendous offensive years until he got hurt in 2003. Remember, he had the the torn groin muscle and. He was never really the same after that, but for that that four year stretch, yep, the best offensive player the Mets have ever had. Well, he did say that that nine or ten day stretch, guys, when he was traded from the Dodgers to the Marlins and then to the Mets, he said it was about the craziest, craziest ten days of his life. And it was such culture shock. He came from LA, he said he went to the ballpark in flip flops. He had such great success with the Dodgers. He came here and out of the gate, he really didn't know what to make of this city. And his father had a friend who said, Listen, you need to get out. And so he took him down into the West Village. He said, Embrace the city, have success here, and the city will embrace you. And he said that was really the turning point for him, and he turned the corner. Nope. Makes perfect sense. Um, and Mike's a really smart guy, and he's a very cultured yes. guy, and he really did take advantage of everything the city had to offer. And that's something that I forgot to say about Mike. There's a lot of great hitters. There's strike three as Gomez just swinging from his. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the second strike. He's swinging hard enough for it to be three strikes. He is just like swinging from his shoes. There are a lot of very, very. Talented players, but what separates the guys that go to the next level, the highest level, Davis still second, is intelligence and a drive, obviously, to be the best. But an, an, an intelligence, and Mike had that. And he's a guy that played the game and was constantly figuring it out. And you could tell. Two and two to Gomez. He wouldn't chase that one outside. Three and two. Well, Gary's complete interview with Mike Piazza will be seen in a Mike Piazza Mets Hall of Fame special, which SNY will air November the 21st. Mark your calendar. I guess you don't mark your calendar anymore. Everybody enters into their calendar. I still have a book. Yes, yeah, so do I. But <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to be contemporary. As okay. Keith always says. Yes. <laughs> SNY Super Slow Motion is brought to you by your Mercedes-Benz Tri-State dealers. Visit them on the web at searchmercedes.com. Sixth inning, three to one Milwaukee. The Brewers got all three of their runs in the first inning on a pair of home runs. And Gomez takes high, ball four, and the Brewers have two men on. That's the first walk of the night issued by Torres. In fact, the first walk for either side. So two out of two on for Jeff Bianchi. Who has grounded to short and struck out. In the American League wildcard race, big doings in Toronto where the Blue Jays scored four in the fourth and two in the fifth 
And they now lead Tampa Bay six to two in the bottom of the fifth. Cleveland with an early five nothing lead in Minnesota. If that stays the same, then Cleveland and Tampa Bay would be tied at the end of the night. Texas, which began the day a game behind Cleveland, leads it. The Angels one nothing in the second. Well, uh, Jeremy Hellickson, who started for Tampa Bay this evening, has been the weak link on that strong starting staff. Need more any Romero. Any Romero. Any Romero was the kid that they <laughs> yeah. called up after the 18 inning game because Hellickson pitched in relief and couldn't start that Sunday game against Baltimore. First ball player to use a tweet in a positive way. It was very <laughs> great. <laughs> if you missed that story, Romero tweeted during the 18 inning game uh, that was uh, last Friday night that he was available. He was sitting at home yeah. in, uh, in the Dominican and um, got a call the next day said, Come up to Tampa Bay, we, we may have a start for you. Sure enough, he started Sunday, four and two thirds, no runs, one hit. Maybe they need to start him tonight. Tampa Bay has won seven in a row. Cleveland's won seven in a row. But even with the Indians winner winning, the closer Chris Perez has lost his job. 7.52 ERA in August and September. And Terry Francona said he will no longer be the closer. Magaris easing back on the fly ball by Bianchi. Makes it look easy as usual. And the Brewers strand two at the top of the sixth. Mets at the top of the batting order coming up. Third time around the batting order for New York is Eric Young grounds one foul. Eric's 0 for 2, flied out and grounded out. It'll be Young, Duda, and Murphy against Giovanni Garrido in the bottom of the sixth. That's got their run in the second on a sacrifice fly from Juan Lagares. Lucas Duda in an unfamiliar spot, the number two spot in the batting order. First time he's been there since 2010. Daniel Murphy behind him.
You know, the curveball bounced for Jeanette to play. Cross body throw. Close play, but he got it. And Young has retired one away. Well, all through this weekend, Keith has been providing his scouting reports on some of the Mets' young hitters, including the not quite as young Lucas Duda, who spent some time in the minor leagues this year, spent some time on the disabled list, began the year as the starting left fielder, and is finishing it as the starting first baseman. 15 home runs this year, a 352 on base percentage, just 149 with runners in scoring position. So, how does that all shake out for you, Keith? Well, Lucas is a bit of a mystery, and um, I did not like his approach earlier in the year. He was walking too much, taking too many pitches, and his strengths are obviously his power. Um, he does wiggle his bat a lot, doesn't get into position to hit. Um, he needs to look. He didn't used to have a negative in his plate discipline. He's become more aggressive, and I like the fact that he's been more aggressive since he's come back. But he's swinging at more bad pitches. He's having a real difficult time with off speed stuff, change ups, and curveballs. He's fishing a lot, particularly more so against the right handers than the left handers. Um, the outlook for him is getting a chance to play every day too. He knows he's coming to the ballpark and he's going to be in the lineup every day. It's this one behind the second baseman and in front of the right fielder in the shift. And he's got his second hit of the game. So, you know, he's, he's played real well around first base. He's been first base has gotten he's gotten much more comfortable. See, but he's out in front off the end of the bat. He's been way out in front. It's a slow curve. Now watch him hit the ball way out in front. You got to bring that back. Let it come to you a little more. And that's what his problem is. That's why he's been swinging at bad pitches now. now. He's a very inward guy. Doesn't show a lot of emotion, but I've seen it simmer, simmering underneath. I can see it. He's not play, hasn't been hitting well, and he's playing every day. So it's a big dilemma uh, for, for Sandy Alderson here. I mean, this is a big slice of Lucas Duda here since he's been called back. Try to explain this to me, Keith, because I'm not sure that I understand. You get a hitter like Duda, who's had some success with the bases empty. His home runs have mostly come with the bases empty. He's had two hits tonight with the bases empty. Runners in scoring position. He has just failed abjectly this year. How does that happen, and why does it happen? Well, a lot. You don't drive in runs as a hitter, uh, Gary. Early in my career, I was always a clutch hitter. When I became established, but I remember early in my career trying to establish myself. Boy, if you went over four and left runners on base and forward bats, that really got to you. Whereas when you're a veteran and you're in your confident in your abilities, you can let it roll off your back, and tomorrow's another day. Um, it's difficult for me to put a finger on what's going through Lucas's mind. I know that it's wearing on him, but you know what? Like I said yesterday, everybody's gone through this. This is a big chance for him uh, to play every day and uh, to relax and, and get it going and be a part of the ball club. Murphy drives one deep to left. Davis back, and it's over his head and hopping over the wall for a ground rule double. Due to a pull on third, Murphy's 38th double of the year. Well, we mentioned yesterday how Davis likes to play shallow. And that's fine and dandy with the little pin hitters, but you can't do it with the with the little double hitters and, and the guys with power. And in, you know you got a two-run lead here in the sixth inning. You got to be a little smarter than that. It's almost a little bit of arrogance to, for him to play that shallow. He hasn't been in the big leagues long enough to be playing that shallow. That ball can't get over his head. So the tying runs in scoring position with one out. I want to go back to Duda. I don't want to press this point too hard, but I, I'm, I'm just trying to. This is a tough one for me. Well, I understand that. So I want to know from what you've observed. Do you think he puts too much pressure on himself in RBI situations? Do you think he approaches things differently? Do you think he gets pitched differently? Is that are any of those things part of the reason why he's not been as successful? I don't feel they're pitching them differently. Now remember, and Ronnie will attest to this, the game hasn't changed. If they find a weakness, you're going to get it until you prove you can hit it. Lucas has been having trouble with the off speed curveballs and the change ups. And he's been fishing for curveballs in the dirt. You can't hit a breaking ball in the dirt. 
okay? You can't hit it. It's in the dirt. You keep swinging at it, the pitchers are going to keep throwing it, and you guess what? You're going to keep swinging and missing unless you make them bring it up. You've got to make that adjustment. Lucas hasn't made that adjustment. I think he's anxious, absolutely. Turner trying to find the hole. Bianchi with a great play. Can't get it out. Breaking for third is Murphy. He'll make it safely. A run is in. It's now 3 to 2, Milwaukee. Infield hit for Turner brings in a run. And Murphy takes third with one out. Heads up by Murph. The third baseman, Bettencourt, goes in the hole. Okay. His momentum takes him away. Murph reads. Now Murph really didn't have to get back to the bag, but it's a long throw. If anybody's going to cover this base, it's got to be the pitcher, and I, I can I can forgive Gallardo, because this is kind of a free play. Do you agree or no? Uh, I mean, if you're on top of your game, you probably make that play to, to cover. But what you end up doing is you end up becoming a spectator because you want to see is he going to make that play. So three straight hits off Gallardo, the Mets within a run, tying run at third and one out for Brown. It was one for two on the night. And not to beat a dead horse about Duda. Uh, I know we're in a part of the ball game that's kind of important here. I like his swing. I think he's got a chance to be a 20 home run guy. I really do. Well, it's interesting that you say that from that perspective of the chance to be a 20 home run hitter. I mean, he's got 15 this year, right? Basically, half the season. Right. Can he be a 30 home run well, hitter? Well, I don't want to. I hitter? don't want to put that kind of, you know, pressure on him. But I certainly think that he can be a 20, 25 guy, easy. And um, you know, he might just be a late bloomer. Who knows? He's 27. I mean, you know, I, I go back to. We make comparisons all the time. We were talking about Den Decker and Jay Bruce being the same age. You know, Den Decker's 26, Bruce is 26. Bruce has had a six year career. I mean, Duda's only a year older than Den Decker, who we look at as a, you know, a, a raw prospect. So there's still the chance that, that Duda will have big years ahead of him. Well, you know, Duda's had, a, you know, the break. I mean, it's unfortunate. Like Davis pulled the oblique and is out for the year. All that open the door for Duda to play every day. I don't know what Terry Collins would have done with the two of them on the team. You know, how do you if they're not going to put Duda back in the outfield, which they stated when he came back, then Duda wasn't going to was going to share time. Wasn't going to play at all. Right? And so this is an opportunity and he hasn't grasped at that opportunity. He hasn't gone and taken the taken the bull by the horns. Two two to Brown. And he lays off the breaking ball three and two. My perspective, if he doesn't hit 30 home runs for you, doesn't help you. And this is not his first time having an opportunity to win a position. This is his third time. So, you know, in evaluating, how many chances do you get? That's, I guess, my question. I mean, how many guys? There's ball four right there. Gerard loads him up. First walk of the night for Gallardo. A lot of guys go off and get traded and go to a new environment, a new organization, and they they blossom. Well, Sandy was just saying, I mean, this, maybe this town is not for everybody as far as uh, having success. And certainly this, this ballpark makes it difficult for anyone who wants to stay at all runs. Well, at the end of the day, and more specifically, at the end of this season, the Mets are going to have to make a value judgment between Ike Davis and Lucas Duda and everything else that's available out there. Whether that's uh, you know uh, the kid from Cuba, Brayu, or, or you know any other first baseman who might be available, because that's a spot where this team has got to have power. This is not a great home run hitter's ballpark, but as Sandy has preached from the day he got here, you have to be able to hit home runs, and that's a position where you expect to have a home run hitter. And Ike has shown he's he can do it. Dude is at 15 this year. You don't know what he might do in the future. It's going to be a fascinating yeah. winter to watch and see what the Mets do. Yep. Bob Wooten, who pitched last night, is up in the bullpen for the Brewers. So the Mets with their chance here against Gallardo. Bases loaded, one out, down three to two. But Garris drove in the first Met run with a sacrifice fly.
dribbler foul. Nothing in one. It's interesting that we spent that much time on Duda because he's that much of, a, of, an, of an, an enigma. An enigma wrapped in a mystery, surrounded by a puzzle. <laughs> it's also when you when you know he's such a such a nice young man that you want him want it to happen for him. Garris takes mm. a fastball right on the corner for a strike, and it's 0-2. A mm. little borderline. Didn't get the call, and now he's got to bear down. Well, Dale Scott's had a pretty big strike zone all game. Mm, that's a strike. A little cutter there from Gallardo. A little bit of paint. Base is loaded, one out, 0-2 to Lagaris. that one away. Murphy at third, Turner at second, Brown at first, and one out. A run is in for the Mets here in the sixth. Gallardo at 95 pitches for the night. Garris, did he go around? He did. Strike three. Well, you knew that he was going to do that, Ronnie. Young hitter. Gallardo needs a strikeout. He goes to his trusty curveball in the dirt. He's got a catcher back there who smothers everything, so you don't have you know, have the confidence you can bounce at any time. So it's left to Travis Darno. Who is one for two tonight? Drove a base hit to right center his last time up. Seven hits in his last 17 at bats has pushed his batting average over 200 at 206. Base is loaded two down for Darno. Takes up and away for ball one. Fredo Tovar would be next. And Dono pops it foul. One and one. Cleveland now leads Minnesota seven nothing in the second inning. While Tampa Bay continues to trail Toronto six two in the seventh. The Angels have tied up the Rangers 1 1 in the third. A strange win for Texas last night. Mike Baxter with a bat in his hands. The pitcher spot two batters away. 1 and 1 to Darno. Mm. And a slider right on the corner 1 and 2. That's the same pitch he threw to Lagar. Yeah, it was the four almost perfect pitch. Can't hit it. Got to take it. Garno about to throw his 100th pitch of the night, hoping it gets him out of the jam. One two to Darno. He lays off the breaking ball. Here comes Murphy trying to score, and he's out at the plate. Oh. Maldonado put the tag on Murphy, who tried to sprint home on a ball that only got about five feet away from the catcher, and Murph is out to end the inning. That's settled for one run in the sixth. Murphy's mad dash. Maldonado able to recover and make the tag. No. Evasive action, not effective. Inning over.
Let me make it. I don't think it's far enough away. Look at that. It's just trying to make something happen. Nice play by Maldonado, by the way. Well, I think that's the key. If you've been watching this game, um, why would you ever think that Maldonado would not keep the ball close enough? He's done it all game. Scott Atchison on to pitch for the Mets in the seventh inning. Got him. That's a heck of a play. The Western roll, by the way, by Murphy, if you remember the old Western. high jumping test technique. Oh, it's not a Fosbury flop? No. Fosbury <laughs> flop. Old school. <laughs> Atchison pitching wonderfully coming down the stretch. Well, he really has. I think uh, the, the one thing that he's had, uh, Gary and Keith, is he's had a little more rest. So he's had some days off, and when he's come back, his slider has been sharp. Tuesday night worked a 1 2 3 in Cincinnati. Start this outing by striking out the Unieski Bedcourt. Monday at 6 p.m., radio host Steve Covino and Rich Davis will be bringing their edgy take on New York sports to SNY, breaking it all down with their unique fans' perspective. Don't miss the premiere of Covino and Rich, presented by Coors Light, Monday at 6 p.m., right here on SNY. Well, here is Martin Maldonado who made that play at the plate to keep the Brewers in front. And I think that's the thing, you know, when the ball first hit the dirt, Murphy probably thought the ball was going to carry him a little further away from Maldonado than it did. Oh. Maldonado gets under one at deep left. That ball's heading toward the wall and out of here. Maldonado off the facing of the second deck, his fourth home run of the year. So after making a fine defensive play, Maldonado adds a long ball, and the Brewers lead it four to two, their third home run of the night. And the Brewers have to be saying to themselves, hit a little kid, hit some. It makes the cheese head uh, happy. A little uh, monster. This is a monster home run right here. Of all three home runs, which has accounted for the four runs, all four of the runs have all been hanging breaking balls, RJ. Yeah. Oh. So that was slugged by Maldonado to give the Brewers a two run lead. Now Juan Francisco is going to bat for Giovanni Gallardo, whose season comes to a close in line for his 12th win of the year. Francisco started at first base last night, went one for four and drove in a run. Andrew Feliciano getting ready with the left hand hitter Aoki on deck. Why do you come out of your last start of the season? What does that feel like? Um, well, if, if you've had a good year, Gary, you uh, you have you give yourself a second to uh, be proud of yourself, you know, for for withstanding the 162 game schedule, for making your 34 or 35 starts, for being a, a you know a part of your team that's a, a real plus. And if you've had a bad year, um, regret. Where did it go wrong? Um, and I can't wait to, to get the next year to, to, to a race this year. I know it's endemic to what a pitcher is because he works only once every five days. But when there are several days to go in the season and your season's over, is that a weird kind of a feeling? It, it, it's, it's a weird feeling. I think that uh, you do, though, try to be a good teammate and spend the rest of your time. Uh, Encouraging the other pitchers that are going to pitch to, you know, get one more W, add one to the slate. Um, you don't want to shut it down and hang in the clubhouse or any of that kind of stuff. You just, you know, you want to end the season by, by being a, a, an asset, not a, not a minus. Francisco lining out to Turner for the second out, and Atchison will stay in to face Nori Aoki, who tries to drag a bunt and bunts it foul. In Cincinnati, Pedro Alvarez has just hit a home run for the Pirates, who lead the Reds four to one as they go to the bottom of the sixth at Great American Ballpark. How about the way that A.J. Burnett has pitched now down the stretch? By the way, our producer wanted us to note that's 35 home runs for Pedro Alvarez. They went to the same oh, high school. Oh, that's right. Drag bunt. Atchison makes the easy play. Side retired. The Brewers extend their lead. Martin Maldonado with his fourth home run of the year and the Brewers third home run of the night. That sends us to the bottom of the seventh stretch time with the Brewers up four to two.
Why is brought to you by Geico. By AT&T, rethink possible. And by Mazda, if it's not worth driving, it's not worth building. Always good when we can work the Brooklyn Bridge into our, uh, our billboards. The Manhattan Bridge, though, just doesn't get a lot of love, it's, does it? You know, it spills you onto Canal Street. It's in the wrong place. If it were a little further uptown or downtown, but it's right next to the Brooklyn Bridge. Agreed. The inferiority complex built in. Rob Wooden comes in to pitch the bottom of the seventh. Spills you into Chinatown, though. And anytime you can work the Chrysler building into one of their shots of the city, makes all the other buildings pale. That's the how, how am I doing bridge. <laughs> the Edcock? Yeah. Sorry, it's the it's the Queensboro Bridge. It's the 59th Street Bridge. I agree. I agree. Travis Darnot won for two tonight. He was left at the plate when Murphy made his mad dash and was tagged out. Pops one up in his shallow right. Jeanette goes out and calls. One hands it, one out. So Darnot retired. Wilfredo Tobar coming up. He's 0 for 2, struck out and grounded into a double play. Giovanni Gardo, six innings, two runs, seven hits, one walk, six strikeouts, a chance for his 12th. Win of the year after winning 16 last year. Rob Wooden worked last night, gave up a double to Murphy, a walk to Duda, but get out of that with a double play. Tovar at the plate, Baxter on deck to pinch it, and Wilfredo takes a strike. They've gone to the eighth in Toronto, Blue Jays six, Rays two. Well, for the sake of Scoreboard watching and entertainment value in a pennant race the next two days. That's one that everybody in baseball except the Rays is rooting for. Yeah. <laughs> it's slider by Wooten, one and two. Cardinals have gone up four nothing on the Cubs there in the third. David Fries a home run. If the Cardinals win, it's all over in the National League Central. That or a Pittsburgh loss would clinch it for the Cardinals. Yep. And then the Cardinals' next goal would be to clinch the best record in the National League. They went into the night tied with the Braves, each at 94 and 65. Braves are scoreless with the Phillies in the seventh. One and two to Tovar, the number eight hitter. And Wooten misses up and away, two and two. Got him. Two out. So Wooten has his first strikeout. Two out and nobody on. SNY Super Slow Motion is brought to you by your Mercedes Benz Tri State dealers. Visit them on the web at searchmercedes.com. That's still the biggest mystery of the night. Why did Carlos Torres throw a ball on the upper deck? Bucket head. <laughs> Talking about Jay? <laughs> that young lady will be designing fashion. Yeah, right. Be innovative. Mike Baxter takes a strike. Baxter started three straight games. Went 0 for 3 last night. And he yanks one down the right field line for a base hit. Cut off by Aoki, and Baxter will stop at first base. So Baxter continuing to excel as a pinch hitter. Breaking ball. Too much plate. Flat. Stays right on it. Hasn't been an easy slog for it's been a slog for, for Baxter. Been struggling a little bit. But there gets the barrel out. 
been an odd thing with Mike. He's now eight for 28 as a pinch hitter. That's 286. He's hitting 165 in the rest of his at bats. Mm. But he has proven last year and this that he can come off the bench and be a pinch hitter. And you know, I know that Mike is a little bit down on the way his season has gone, but that's a very important factor when you start to assess his value going into next year. Because as the Mets continue to upgrade, that would be Baxter's spot as a left handed bat off the bench. Gonzalez <laughs> Hairman up alongside Pedro Feliciano with the Mets bullpen. Once Matt Harvey's teammate at the University of North Carolina deals the 1 1 outside, 2 and 1. Young tonight 0 for 3. Flyed out and grounded out twice. Last time up, a nice play by Scooter Jeanette to throw him out. Old buddy Mike Gonzalez up in the bullpen for the Brewers. <laughs> Prefers to be known as Michael these days. No longer rocking and rolling. 2 and 2 now to Young. Of course, there's even Miguel Gonzalez in Baltimore. That's right. Now, Starting pitcher. Michael Gonzalez. And who used to be Mike. Who used to play in Baltimore. Very confusing. <laughs> this is Rob Wood, who has only played in Milwaukee in his major league career. Mets have out hit the Brewers eight to five. They out hit the Brewers last night as well and lost that game four to two. Now Wooten goes full on young. Bernardo has got a workout back there. Gallardo spinning those curveballs in the dirt. Now a few sinkers awry from Wooten. Baxter will run with three and two and two down. See he's directing, standing up, letting the pitcher know that the first baseman's playing behind the runner Baxter. Three two to Young. Breaks his bat, pops run up shallow center. Bianchi goes back to get it, and that retires the side. A hit and one left. On we go to the eighth at City Field. With the Brewers up four to two.
Kennedy Field. Ah, the later hose it. Straight from Milwaukee. Rooting on his Brewers. Pedro Feliciano will come on as we go to the top of the eighth inning. Well, you think Feliciano might be here just for one batter. Two right handers up behind Jeanette. And Scooter pulls one foul. Jeanette 0 for 3 tonight, but in the first inning he struck out the ball that got away from Darno. Went to second on a balk and then scored on a two run homer by Chris Davis. Carlos Torres had a a wacky first inning gave up a couple of home runs a wild pitch a balk three runs in that inning and then nothing for the ensuing five innings. Well, so far that's enough to beat him. Scott Atchison gave up a home run in the seventh to Maldonado. Drag one attempt by Jeanette. So that's how Ioki ended the seventh and how Jeanette starts the eighth by being thrown out trying to bunt his way on. That'll be the only batter for Feliciano. Right hand hitters coming up. So two pitches for perpetual Pedro and his night is over. It's been going awfully well. It's been going that way for Pedro. Call to the bullpen brought to you by Verizon Wireless for to Milwaukee in the eighth. Gonzalez here man coming in. Westoff joins the crew to bring you a complete game breakdown, plus your exclusive on-field interviews and Rex Ryan's post-game comments. And Jonathan Lucroy hits one out to right field, and Andrew Brown has it for the second out. Jets post-game live presented by Toyota Sunday immediately after the Jets Titans game, only on SNY. Gonzalez Hair Man has already gotten it out in the midst of a promo. A very nice job. Two-thirds of innings last relief appearance, hitless innings. Against the Cincinnati Reds. So Monday in the 10 inning loss in the first game of that series. In fact, the only game the Mets lost on that road trip. So Chris Davis will bat with two out and nobody on. Davis says the big blow in this game, a two run homer in the first inning. Two for three on the night. The one out that he made was one of, uh, one of the more bizarre plays of the season. He lined one back to the mound. He hit Carlos Torres in the foot. Popped up in the air. Torres grabbed it with his bare hand for an out. Ball never hit the ground. Carlos Gomez would be next. And that bizarre out was lovely, but this was more lovely for Mr. Davis. 11th home run on a hanging breaking ball from Torres. He just couldn't get out of the gate. Gave up the two home runs and three runs in the first. 
And here, man, misses with the change up two and one. Well, Texas got two runs in the bottom of the third off C.J. Wilson. It's now the Rangers three, the Angels one as they go to the fourth. So Tampa Bay trails, Cleveland's up big, and Texas now leads. If it were to wind up that way tonight, it'd be three teams separated by one game for those two wild card spots. Here, man can't field it. Murphy does, but gets him at first base as Davis took a bad step getting to the bag, and he might be hurt. Looked like he was going to be able to beat it out once that ball got past the pitcher, but he comes up late as Murphy makes the play to first base. season as the Mets and Brewers play a late afternoon affair Aaron Harang will go for the Mets Jimmy Nelson gets his first big league star for the Brewers 3:30. our coverage tomorrow afternoon on SNY Chris Davis has to come out of the game after pulling something on his way to first base well I initially thought it was a maybe a hip flexor and then Ronnie you thought it was a quad but look where he grabs the old hammy <laughs> He's having everything. I don't know what it is. Well, Something Ron Renick, he wants to know. And you see Davis grabbing at the back of his left leg. So Logan Schaefer will come in to replace him in left field. He'll bat ninth. The new pitcher is Brandon Kinsler, who worked the one, two, three inning last night. Well, he's been one of their more dependable arms in that bullpen for Ron Renicky. All the numbers good across the board. Lucas Duda leads off of the Mets in the home eighth inning. Duda has two hits and three at bats in his first game this year in the two spot of the batting order. He doubled over the first base bag in the third, singled to right, and scored a run in the sixth. It'll be Duda, then Murphy and Turner for the Mets in the eighth. Bob Wooden worked the scoreless inning behind. Giovanni Gallardo who went the first six. Kinsler who stands five foot ten. You see too many five foot ten inch right handers. Throw as hard as he does. A 40th round draft pick by the Padres. Here he is having a successful year. Two 
two to Duda. I didn't know you say that, Gary, and, and you kind of uh, just say quickly pass over it. But really, there's serious bias against a right-hander if they're five ten or shorter uh, in the minor leagues. You, you just don't get the same look as those six four guys do. Don't get drafted as high, which means you don't get as much of an investment in you as Duda goes down looking for the first out. Which means you don't get as much of a chance to pitch, and you have to work that much harder than everybody else to overcome all that and get to the big league. I pitched with a, uh, I've mentioned it on the broadcast before in AAA with a, a young man, his name was Jeff Bittaker, and every year he was just outstanding. Um, I think part of it was there was so much pitching in the major leagues that he didn't get his look, but uh, he did everything you could ever do in AAA, but since he was a little shorter, um, didn't always maybe looked at the same way. Shane. Murphy hits a comebacker. Kinsler uses all of his 5'10 to make the play. And there are two out. See, 5'10 is plenty. That's right. Murphy ends up with only a sliver in his hands. So, two quick outs for Kinsler in the home eight. And now Justin Turner is two for three. Turner two for three off the bench last night after Wright got hurt. Two more hits and an RBI today. So taking advantage of his opportunities, Turner up to 284 on the year. It's really closed well this season. We don't know if David Wright will be in the lineup tomorrow. It was his thumb, not his head, that kept him out of the lineup tonight. Hurt the thumb as he went down after being hit in the helmet last night. Braced that right hand on the ground as he fell. Kinsler to get ahead one and two. Pretty good one good one two punch out of that bullpen and really? in Kinsler. Well, well what's interesting is that they remind me of pitchers you'd have in the bullpen in the day. Sinker slider guys, lots of movement, throw strikes. Up to the right side. Pitcher's gonna have to cover. And Kinsler gets over for the four one put out. One, two, three, go the Mets in the bottom of the eighth. On to the ninth we go with the Brewers up four to two.
against Jimmy Nelson. Tomorrow, John Neese will make his start Sunday against Marco Estrada on the season's closing day. Another bunt attempt. Gonzalez Herman picks it out of the air nice. to retire Carlos Gomez. What is it with the bunt attempts by the Brewers these last three innings? I don't know. I think they must have a bet on the bench who can get the first bunt hit. That's three of the last five batters who've tried to bunt their way on. They've all been retired. Thank you very much. Nice play by Herman with the back end. Snow cone. Nice play, athletic. So Gomez 0 for 3 tonight. No histrionics. <laughs> now Jeff Bianchi is 0 for 3. And he takes a strike. Looking ahead to the bottom of the ninth, the Mets will have Andrew Brown, Juan Lagaris, and Travis Darno do up. Oh, and two to Bianchi. By the way, Jimmy Nelson who makes that start tomorrow. Not his first time at City Field. He was in the Futures game. Oh, okay. This year. Dick Black up in the Mets bullpen. Good sinker. Oh, what a change up there. So Bianchi out on strikes. Two out and nobody on. Good sink. Yeah, she really turned it over. Yes, sir. Yes. Al almost when it's at its best, it's almost like a screwball from her men. So two out and nobody on for Unieski Betancourt, who's gone over three, struck out twice tonight. And he lifts one to center field, chasing Ligaris back. Plenty of room. Side retired. Easy inning for Gonzalez here. Man, he threw just six pitches. Mets will come up in the bottom of the ninth, trailing four to two. Because Chris Carlin and Bobby Ojeda will be along with WB Mason post game live all the highlights all the interviews all the commentary everything you need right after the game right here on SNY Jim Henderson who earned his 27th save last night goes for 28 tonight. Well pretty impressed with his fastball last night. Uh, true 94 miles an hour and a good slurve. Medical report on the Brewers Chris Davis is a daily double. Tight left hamstring, strained right quad. So we got it right. 
Everything but the hip flexor. Hold up. That's right. One for two. Two for three. <laughs> At 667. <laughs> so Henderson trying to finish it off for Giovanni Gallardo. Brewers won last night 4 to 2. Lead tonight 4 to 2. Mets had eight hits last night. They have eight hits tonight. Andrew Brown will lead off. Brown has one of those eight hits, a bloop single to right in the second. Since then, he struck out and walked one for two. And takes inside from Henderson. Juan Lagares on deck, and then Travis Darno for the Mets in the ninth. They've gone to the ninth in Toronto. Blue Jays six, Rays two. Atlanta moved closer to clinching the best record in the National League. Chris Johnson a home run at the bottom of the eighth. The Braves beat the Phillies one to nothing. If the Braves and Cardinals tie for the best record, the Braves have the tiebreaker. They won the season series from St. Louis. So one more win and they would clinch. The best record. Mm. Swing and a miss. One and two. Pittsburgh and Cincinnati are in the bottom of the eighth. Pirates up four to one. St. Louis up six nothing on the Cubs in the fifth. So Cardinals look like they may well clinch that NL Central tonight. One two to Andrew Brown. That's well outside. Cleveland up big on Minnesota seven to one in the fifth. Indians could be tied with the Rays by the end of the night with Texas a game back because Texas has a lead three to one on the Angels in the fifth. Those were all the games of import tonight. Brown pops one up. And Jeanette with the ankle in the foul ground. One out. Coming up tonight on Geico Sports Night after the post game, we'll hear about the Jets and the Giants as they get ready for their games this weekend. And we'll update all the MLB playoff news on Geico Sports Night right after the post game, right here on SNY. Now Juan Lagares is driven in one of the two men runs tonight with a sacrifice fly. But in his biggest at bat of the night of the sixth with the bases loaded and one out he was a strikeout victim against Giovanni Gallardo. Trying to bunt his way on but it goes foul. <laughs> at the Lagares fourth one caught the fever. Well, nothing wrong with that play you know you need a base runner so. Yep. Waving at the slider and Henderson quickly ahead 0 and 2. Very interesting to me that he has two arm angles more over the top on his breaking ball and more to the side on his fastball. I guess it is not visible for the for the hitters. O2. Garris lays off that slider. One two from Henderson. And Lagares takes strike three called two out. Nine strikeouts for Brewers pitching tonight. Mets have struck out more than any team in the National League this year. That's 1,371 now. Outside corner and knees. Pitchers pitch. It's the third called strike on Met hitters tonight. So the Mets are down to their final out. Travis Darno the batter. 
Garneau is one for three, single leading off the fifth. If he gets on, Josh Satin would come up to pinch hit for Wilfredo Tovar. That fan has not lost hope. <laughs> Brewers with three home runs tonight. They've only had five hits. But the long balls have been enough so far. And now Henderson trying to finish it off. Two and out to Darno. That's a drawn just one walk tonight. Go with those nine strikeouts. There's Satin on deck to bat for Tovar. Now the 2 0. And Darno pops it up. Maldonado coming back. And can't quite reach that. 2 and 1. Tampa Bay has a run home in the top of the ninth at Toronto. Blue Jays 6, Rays 3. And that game just ended. Final score 6 3 Toronto. So the Rays seven game winning streak ends and if Cleveland wins they'll be tied with Tampa Bay and if Texas wins they'll be one game behind the pair wow. going into the last two days of the year. Every chance now of a three way tie. Darno flies one out to center that should do it Carlos Gomez makes the call. And the Brewers have put together back to back four to two victories to start out this final series of the year. Three Milwaukee home runs, two of them early against Carlos Torres. Giovanni Gallardo goes six, gets the win as Milwaukee wins at four to two. Well, Mets out hit the Brew Crew eight to five, but too much power from the, the Brewers. Three home runs, two in the first inning, a two run shot from Davis. His 11th, Aoki led it off with his eighth solo. Maldonado in the seventh was the fourth run. That was his fourth home run. And the Mets never could come back from that. Well, Torres got off to a slow start, three runs in the first inning. And uh, Gallardo kind of plowed through his six innings, that good breaking ball providing him with the win. Your time winner game summary. Nori Aoki led off the game with a home run. Chris Davis a two run homer later in that first. And that's enough for the Brewers tonight as they win it four to two. The Cheeseheads will leave happy tonight. Milwaukee wins it. More coming up from City Field in just a moment.